So we're now up to chapter five. We're about halfway through the book. Um, and that does, I mean, I have the actual printed book and we are, well, where's the camera? There it is. We're about halfway through <laughs> the book and we've learned a lot. Uh, I think this is kind of the last chapter of just plain probability theory. And then from here on out, we get into what I think is going to be very interesting, which is the applying this now to some things that I'm sure you and I are both familiar with and anyone else studying this book is familiar with, but now to see it in a little more rigor uh, would be very interesting to me, like the regression and hypothesis tests and all that kind of stuff would be very interesting to see um, done now that we have a little more meat on our bones with respect to understanding the mathematics. So this is the last probability focus chapter and this one is about joint distributions. Uh, I found this chapter quite dense. I don't know if you did as well, Lucio, but I thought this was extremely dense chapter and it did take me a little while to get through it. So I'm going to, I have some notes that go along with the book, but please, as always, jump in if there's some particular aspect of this chapter that you found um, challenging. I, there were parts I found challenging. Some of them I just said, you know what? That's not that important. <laughs> so I'm just gonna move on past this part. I need to get all lost in the weeds of all this rigor. But um, if there are some of these things you want to discuss that I skip over or that I do mention in a very fast way, don't hesitate to interrupt me. That's what we're here for. We're here to discuss uh, the book more than anything else. Um, so pressing on, the goal in this chapter, I felt, was first of all, just to learn how joint distributions are defined. We certainly used joint distributions our whole data science careers. But um, I think most of us, at least myself, we play a little fast and loose with them. And it's nice to try to put some rigor in that as well. So uh, that's one of the first things we're going to do. Then we're going to learn about joint expectation, which is basically the expectation of the product of two random variables and why that particular choice is important. Uh, and then we're going to look at conditional distributions and expectations. We know about conditional probability, but now we're going to talk about conditional distributions and conditional expectations, which are very important tool for uh, understanding, for doing a lot of problems in data science, certainly. And then the one of the most important examples is this multivariate normal distribution, which comes up pretty much everywhere. And we kind of approximate a lot of things by multivariate normal distribution. So it's useful to understand those in some detail as well. At the very end, if there's time, I will talk about the principal component analysis. The book does a fine job with that. So if we don't have time, I'm happy to just abandon that. But um, it is interesting that principal component analysis, I've done it in, in the book introduction for statistical learning. And here it seems like a little bit easier to understand. It's simply the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Okay, now you're just gonna decompose the uh, variance matrix, but we'll get there. Anyway, that's what I thought was interesting about that part. So first, uh, briefly, the joint distributions are just simply high dimensional PDFs, CDFs, and CDFs. Um, here, it gives you an example of probability distribution function that is a function of many variables, n of them, and you can organize them into a vector as it is shown on the left-hand side uh, where it's a random vector now and the distribution over the vectors is given by some function of all the components of that vector essentially, right? Um, so the first part of the chapter is going to have a two variable joint distribution just to focus on that and understand the how things are defined. And the second part will deal with multivariate, more than two, but focusing just on the special case of the of the multivariate Gaussian. That's the kind of the plan of the chapter. So this is the the next part of the book see I call it the many definitions section because he just defines these things one after another. Um, and you know and of course gives some motivations for these definitions, but it's not terribly exciting, right? I mean so especially if you worked with these things a long a long time, you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I get what you're saying, man. Uh, do you have that same impression, Lucio? Do you think? Uh, yeah, it was mainly uh, stuff we've already seen. Yeah. So just for the sake of completeness, I'll just go through these. Uh, joint PMF is just straightforwardly. It's you know, it's for a PMF for, is for a discrete variable. So the probability uh, mass function for a joint distribution like this, x and y, is simply the probability that x equals x and y equals y. So that's all it is, right? It's the most straightforward thing. And for a PDF, this definition is a little, it's basically the same thing, okay, I guess, if, if you think about with delta functions or something, but to, it's, done, it's rather defined in a roundabout way. 
uh, that it's a function, the function that will give you the probability of an event when integrated over the, the, uh, the area of that event, right? The region of that event. The, and that's the definition is, is given. Now, a similar way probably just read a function in one dimension was defined actually. It's defined as a measure, which is what this basically says. Um, it also defines marginal PDFs and PMFs, and that's just the idea that if you want to get back to one variable when you don't care about the other variable, you can just integrate over that, or sum, as the case may be, over that other variable. That's the marginal distribution. Uh, the other thing was independent variables. Uh, var the variables are independent if you can factor the PMF and PDF, basically is what, uh, what, um, what, indep what independence implies, essentially, right? It just comes from this definition of what independence is, but applied to a distribution. Let's see. And then finally, this important concept that you'll see over and over again, if you haven't already, this idea of independent and identically distributed random variables. And that means that all the random variables, not only can you factor the PMF PDF into a, a product like this, but all the distributions are the same. So you can just pick one of them, for example, say, oh, it's the product of N of these the distributions for variable one because they're all the same, right? So you've seen that, I'm sure. Uh, by the way, this notation is, I guess, important, but gets very, very tedious to have to keep writing capital X, capital Y, and then small x, small y. Oh my goodness, it's so tedious. But I get why they do it because it's important to understand which distribution, which measures you're using. But um, I know that in applied work, you don't normally see this. You just, you know, it's just f of x and y, and everybody understands what distributions we're talking about. At least that's been my experience. When you're typing this in late tech, it's a little bit frustrating. Uh, I didn't have room on that page for continuing the many definitions. So here's some more. <laughs> the joint CDF can be de defined in the obvious way, just the integra integral over the variables. You were variables where the X's and Y's, right, are bigger than, um, uh, or for, sorry, from minus infinity to whatever value of X and Y you have in here, or the sum up to those X and Y's either way. Just the same, it's an obvious generalization of the, uh, single variable CDF and for independent variables those sums and equals can be factored as well obviously and let's see and there's also the concept of the marginal CDF where you just set the other the other variable you don't care about now in this case you just set it to infinity which has the effect of integrating over that uh, integrating out that other variable hope that makes sense again if I'm going too fast which I am trying to go fast because I think this is somewhat review and it's just definitions which you read and I read them and it, I'm not doing much service here by just repeating them. I, I guess the only service I'm providing here is by repeating these and say, these are the ones that fell, came up to me as being the most important to maybe notate and remember later in the, for later in the book or later in whatever. Finally, uh, for the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us how to recover the, um, or determine the probability distribution function from a, uh, uh, cumulative distribution function just by doing this second derivative here. So that's the whirlwind tour of the joint probabilities and joint CDFs. Finally, uh, joint expectation. So this is the expectation of X times Y for two variables, right? Which is simply what you think it would be just, you know, take your measure, uh, integrate or sum over it with the product X, Y, right? And he's, then he says, well, why this particular thing is called joint expectation? Which, by the way, I've never actually heard this called the joint expect. I just the expectation value of x and y, but I guess that's what it's called. Have you heard it called joint expectations, particular x y expectation? Uh, no, but actually, I'm not sure uh, when he writes the expectation of x y. Does he means like the actual product of x and y, or like yes, x comma y as a vector? Yeah, no, he means the actual product of x times y. Uh, that's the product of the random variables, right? The expectation of the product of the random variables, okay. which you can calculate by the way, it's on the right-hand side of this expression here. So, so those, uh, they wouldn't really be a definition mark. It's more like an theorem, right? Yeah. Okay. I think if I understand what you're saying. No, I mean, the, no, I mean the joint, this is a definition. Yeah, E, X, and Y is, is well, I guess, oh, this, this statement I made is, uh, you're right, this is actually how you calculate, so I guess it is in the, in the sense of theorem. But he just writes it, no, he writes it as a definition. He says that 
definition 5.10. But you're right. I mean, it's just, isn't it just what, how else would you calculate the actuation value of the product of the random variables? I don't know. Because I, I would think that uh, for the expectation of the product of X and Y, uh, one would one would uh, one would treat it like X and the product S Y is a random variable as well. So perhaps yes. one would use a one dimensional formula, but for this new uh, random variable X Y. So uh, uh, I don't know. I got confused because I don't know if yeah those first expressions are a definition or a theorem. I can't, I can't uh, alleviate that confusion either because I, I think it would almost be a theorem. But yeah, he does present it as a definition. Okay. There must be a reason for that. Maybe it's not obvious that you can just write this. It is to me because I'm just used to doing it. But maybe it's mathematically not rigorous. <laughs> it's like kind of like some things are weird. Like in probability, the definition of conditional probability is a definition. Whereas I'm like, well, how else would you define? It? I don't know. But yeah, but maybe that's maybe it's one of those things that's similar to that. But in any event, the book spends some time, like pages, discussing why this is so important and because it leads to the correlation and covariance. And he spends some time justifying it for the discrete case, but I'm not, I'm just going to skip all that. I certainly found it illuminating to read, but I don't, I don't think it's something that I'm going to keep in my head. So, um, but we do know that the covariance of two variables can be defined in this way. And this is a definition, right? Um, uh, expectation value of x minus its mean times y minus its mean that's the covariance by definition and if we define uh, covariance this way that allows us for example is to define this theorem like we already know the expectation value of the sum of two random variables is just the separate expectation values but we now we can compute the variance of the sum of two random variables which is the variance of x plus the variance of y plus this cross term two times the covariance between x and y so if X and Y are, uh, well, I've gotten to that yet, but we'll um, see in a minute more about this. I was gonna, I'll just say, but it's obvious as you've read the book too, you know that if two variables are independent, X covariance of X and Y is zero. And therefore in that case for independent variables, the variance of X plus the variance of Y is just the sum of the variances, which I think is something we established before. I'm not sure, but it's something commonly you use all the time in, in applied work for sure. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm missing something here, but I don't know what it is. And um, yeah, I think we didn't really see the formula for the variance of a sum. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Random variables. Uh, only now. In any event, that's the definition of covariance. And uh, one, I mean, it's just a definition. One way to justify it is it is, it is a useful generalization of the variance. Like if X equals Y, then this is just the variance. So um, that's one way to kind of justify it. But continuing on, we'll justify it further by seeing some other properties of the uh, covariance. One thing we can define is the correlation coefficient, which is the covariance normalized by the variance of the two variables. And this has the property as he shows through this analogy to the cosine angle. Uh, varying from minus one to one for two random variables. And we can see that if uh, two random variables are independent, then they're also uncorrelated as, you know, briefly proven in the book. And furthermore, that the expectation value of X times Y in that special case is then just going to be the expectation value of X times expectation value of Y, which sort of just, let me go up one, because it just follows from this equation right here, right? Because uh, then in that case, the expectation, the covariance is zero, right? So then this this minus this is zero. So that tells you that the expectation of x times y is just the product of expectation of x times expectation of y when they're independent. That's extremely useful uh, result when you're doing applied work as well. Wait, is the variance uh, a, sense, a kind of inner product? Yes, absolutely. I and mean, that's one of the things that I skipped over, right? Where it shows it is an inner uh, product. Yeah, because yeah. the formulas... Uh, they they seem quite analogous to they are to, to basic inner product stuff that one sees in linear algebra. Yeah, he talks about this. I mean, that's the part I skipped over, but that justifies all this, right? Because yeah, um, if you if, if you if you remember, it's like page um, yeah here it is page two fifty eight right at the bottom there. He talks about 
the x base five x y is a weighted inner product between the, the different state spaces. So that's how we that's kind of how we justifies this formula. But I'm just taking it as given because I don't want to spend too much time focusing on that aspect of it. Let's see. So back to this then. Um, when, so now we have a co correlation coefficient. We can also compute an estimate from that from the data just by using the corresponding estimates of the variance, corresponding estimates of the covariance, right? Uh, just by this formula here. And just as an example, I generated some uh, random data, put together a, uh, well, so the, some of this requires, ignore some of this because it requires knowing how to do these multivariable, multivariable normal variables, but I'm just going to pretend you didn't forget about that. Um, here's the data, some simulated data. See, as you can see, this is X and Y, and you can see that there is a high degree of correlation between these, not perfectly correlated, but there's a high degree of correlation, and we can compute with in R by just using this function core, uh, what the correlation between those two uh, variables is, and it happens to be 0.574. When we get to the part about uh, multivariate, Gau multivariate Gaussians, which I generated, you can see um, that that does match the value that it should be. I should have left this up because I realize now that it's not convenient to talk about the this matrix here. <laughs> Because we haven't discussed yet, but you read the book, you know that this is the covariance matrix for this multivariate Gaussian, and if the uh, the correlation coefficient should be equal to the um, the covariance, which in this case is one, the off diagonal, right, divided by the square root of the product of the two variances, which is the diagonal element of this matrix, which is one over square root of three. So it does match the numerically what I found there, and I recognize now that that whole discussion was kind of a mess, but I hope it makes some sense and. To you? Yeah, it did. Okay, good. All right, so where were we at? Oh yeah, conditional PMFs and, uh, wait, what? Yeah, so now we're gonna talk about conditional probably mass function, probably distribution functions. And again, these are defined, uh, well, for the discrete case, it really just is the conditional probability because if you write, okay, what's the conditional pro probability mass function of X given Y, it's gonna be the probability that X equals X given Y equals Y. And we can write that using Bayes' rule uh, as, well, actually, I'm using the definition of conditional probability as this, right? Uh, probability of x equals x and y equals y divided by the probability that y equals y. And then putting those back into the form of joint distributions, we see the, def the formula for the conditional PMF is just this. Um, one useful result is if you have a conditional distribution and you need, for example, the marginal, uh, to, for example, compute the probability of an event, we only care about the uh, X, for example. So given the, what's probably the X is in some set A, um, well, that's gonna be this sum of the joint distribution, right? I have, to I have to marginally integrate out the Y, sum out the Y, but then I only care about the X's that are in the set A. So that's this, that's what this, that's what I mean by the probability of X given A when I have a joint distribution. But often you don't have the joint distribution, you might have, uh, the conditional distribution, or you can rewrite this joint distribution as this conditional distribution times, again, just using this definition up here, right? Um, probability of X given Y times the probability of Y. Now I just have to calculate the probability of X is in a subset. Well, I'm sorry, that, that, that's a lot of words, but it helps me break this problem down into two smaller parts that I can probably, that I can potentially do more easily. Often the joint distribution is more easily expressed as, an, as a product of a conditional distribution times the probability for the other variable. This thing, wow, that's hard to say in, in words, but this is just a way is of- it, Is it like a multidimensional uh, total probability theory? It is, it exactly okay. is, yeah, exactly is. So we can um, also to find a conditional CDF, that's somewhat straightforward way. You just, again, you're just writing the, doing the CDF, but you have a conditional probability distribution, no big deal. Uh, for the conditional, uh, for the continuous case, the conditional PDF is defined in this way. It's just by analogy to how it is for the discrete case and the conditional CDF, again, the same way, right? Um, the book uses this conditional CDF for the continuous case to justify this de definition of the continuous case PDF. 
and we spent some time on that as well. But I'm happy to just take that as, yeah, that makes sense to me. <laughs> it's a complete analogy because I'm a physicist. I don't need all this rigor. The, um, and again, the same way that we did for this case up here where we want to uh, compute the event in, in the margin, like where we don't care about the other variable, we can do this using conditional probabilities. There'll be an example. Oh, I think right now. Okay, good. I need a, I need an example to make that more concrete. I have one here. So here's an example uh, where I want to calculate the probability that y. This is practice exercise four point eight in the book. Five point eight in the book. We want to find out uh, what's the probability that um, the random variable y is greater than some y, right? Where these are the distributions I know. I know that x comes from a uniform distribution, and I know that y comes from an exponential distribution with uh, with rate x. Okay. So I can just use this formula that we had. So first of all, I want to calculate the probability that y is greater than y given, right, a particular x, okay? Um, oh, yeah, I skipped over a step, sorry. So first, what is the part, one of the distributions here? Well, one is just the uniform distribution. The other one, we should be careful and write it out. And it's the probability of y, right, given x, the rate x is this thing. This is just the exponential distribution, but what looks funny is the fact there's x's in there where you normally see lambdas, that's all, right? But it's just the exponential, exponential distribution where lambda equals x. So that's, uh, so then all we have to do is calculate the probability. Again, let me just scroll up here, one page here. What I'm doing is gonna do is this, right? I wanna know, so now the x's and y's are swapped. I think they did that just to make sure that you, stay confused, but uh, I'm doing this formula right here. So first I'm gonna calculate this conditional uh, probability of the event, and then I'm gonna integrate over all the X's. So I calculate, oh, it's right here. <laughs> I calculate uh, probability that Y is greater than Y given a particular X. Well, that's just this integral over Y of this exponential distribution, right? So all the, what's the, all the probability, all the probability mass that's greater than, uh, for y greater than y prime greater than y, just integrate that. I get this expression, e to the minus x y, and then finally to calculate the probability that we want, the answer we want probably that y is greater than y, uh, cap random variable y is greater than y, is now I just have to in, now I just have to do the margin, integrate out the margin, right? So I just write down the probability I already found times the probability for each x, which is uniform, from one to two, do the integral, and that's the answer you get. The point of all this is that often you have not a joint, you often have your joint distribution expressed in terms of these conditional probabilities. And they're built up that way as these products. It's not a factoring, but it's a um, kind of a directed graph almost. Any event. Um, Wait, what? And uh, what directed graph? Uh, for, I'm just thinking out loud. Sorry, I'm just thinking out loud, right? So I mean, the probably the x uh, probability distribution of x and y is equal to this product of this conditional probability probability of x given y times probability of y, right? Um, that's just the definition. But you know, you, you can think of that as being like a, a graph. Uh, you can think of that factoring as being like a, a a graph where it's x the distribution of x points to the distribution of y given x, right? I don't know. That was a that was a, a thought that I just had in my head. So I realize now it's not so easy to express in words. So just ignore that weird aside I made there. Okay. It's, but if you are interested in that weird aside, Google uh, Bayesian uh, networks. Okay, anyway, the conditional expectation is now defined this way, right? So now it's just, it's really just simply the expectation computed with conditional probability, but this is the notation that they use for it. Um, the expectation value of X given Y is simply the expectation value of X, but computed with this X as conditional probability distribution conditional probability distribution. Same thing in the uh, oh, sorry, yeah, conditional mass function. And the same thing in the continuous case with the, with the uh, conditional probability distribution. Well, there's a lot of words in those sentences. 
So um, he introduced this concept of the law of total expectation, which allows us to decompose expectations into smaller expectations, which, you know, it's simply that if I want to know the expectation value for X, I can compute it by computing this conditional expectation and then multiplying and then summing up over all the possible Y's, right? Same thing for the continuous case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's pretty straightforward. The idea is simply that I don't. If I, maybe it's really hard to calculate the expectation value of x, but I can calculate pretty easily the expectation value of x given some uh, one of the other random variables is fixed, and then I can just integrate over. I can just basically do the margin. Essentially, is what you're doing here. You're right? integrating over the margin, marginalizing it, if you will. Uh, and then you introduce this compact notation. And it's basically the same thing, but the subscript here now just simply indicates the measure over which you're taking the expectation. And this kind of thing is like so common in applied um, quantitative finance. They just love this kind of expression in quantitative finance because they do a lot of change of measure to price options and things. So you'll you'll see stuff like this a lot. It gets really like, wow, what are you trying to say? <laughs> it's it's almost too concise, too compact. So let's look at another example. Uh, let's find the expectation value of y, where y is, uh, well, we know the distribution for y at a, for a given x, right? The conditional probability distribution for y is Gaussian with uh, mean x and uh, variance x squared. And x itself is distributed as a Gaussian distribution with mean sigma and variance sigma squared. So first we find this expectation over the conditional distribution of y given x. Well, we know what that is, right? What's the, dis what's the average of this distribution? Well, it's just x, right? So that's pretty straightforward. And then we want to know the average. Now we want to find the distribution average, the expectation value of y. We use this formula. So we want to know the expectation value over the distribution x of this thing, which we computed, which is the random variable x. So we want to know the expectation value of, of x on the distribution x. Well, this is the distribution x, the average value of x is just mu. So you don't even have to mess with any integrals, it's pretty straightforward. But at first it seems kind of daunting, but it turns out it all just falls apart because they're using this conditional expectation. And this is a tool that is quite commonly used in, uh, in applied work. Uh, this next section, which I summarized in just one chart, talks about the sum of two random variables and he goes through and justifies this formula that the uh, PDF for the sum of two random variables is given by the convolution over the distributions for those uh, two random variables. It seems straightforward to me because how else can you do it, right? So if I wanna know for each Z, right? There's only one way to get that particular Z. <laughs> um, if the Y is Y, then the, if, if Y, capital Y takes on the value Y, then capital X has to take on the value of, of, of uh, X minus Y, right? Just, it just makes sense to me. I don't know. Wait, that's not right. X minus Z, I think. No, that's not right, is it? Tell it's wrong. Where's Z? I must have missed copy that. I see. I said, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I like, don't even have that right. Hold on a minute. Do you remember how it works? Yeah, Z minus Y. So that does, that's right. This actually be a Z. We can fix that. So the point was I was trying to make is if if we're trying to find the probability for a particular Z, right? And I know I'm kind of playing fast and loose here with the particular Z because we know the probability of a particular Z is absolutely zero. But um, the the probability of a Z um, or near Z, I should say, then if I know Y is Y, then X has to be in the x plus y is z, that means that x has to be z minus y. So this seems to be the the, the probability uh, that I need, and I just integrate over all the different y's to get the probability of z. That's kind of my free, what do you want to call it? Uh, intuition for that convolution formula. But the book goes through and uh, provides a more rigorous uh, derivation of that, I guess, I would say. Have you seen that before, right? This... Uh, is that Erlang distribution quite common in real life? Is what? 
the uh, when you sum two exponentials, the Erlang distribution. Oh, Erlang? Yeah. Oh, you look at this table down here. Right, so this table gives some common results for different distributions that sum together nicely, I guess you would say. Gaussian obviously does, and and uh, exponential, and or sorry, Poisson does, Binomial does, Bernoulli does, but yeah, exponential, you get this Erlang distribution. Um, I think it's common, like in communication industry, you come with this a lot, because the exponential distribution comes up, up a lot in terms of communication channel rates and things, so you end up having to sum them and there's actually a programming language called Erlang that is commonly used in telecommunications that makes me think that's why that's the case, but I've never even had to use it. Yeah, I just looked up. It was developed by Erlang to, uh, what way to go? Uh, to examine the number of telephone calls which might be made at the same time to operators at switching stations. <laughs> so definitely is a telecommunications thing. That's from Wikipedia. Have you ever used the Erlang distribution? No. Uh, no, it's the first time I hear about it. Only reason I even am familiar with it because I have messed around with the Erlang programming language back in the past. And I was curious what it was called that, but yeah, I've never had to use it. Something to, something more to learn. So that's the end of the, um, the two random variables section. Before I move to the next part, do you, the second half of this chapter, did you have any other comments? I mean, did you, to me, it was just kind of like, you know, all stuff I've seen before presented with a little bit more rigor and some of that rigor, I actually just kind of skipped over anyway, not skipped over it, read through quickly and didn't try to spend a lot of time on that was kind of my approach. I know, but I, uh, you know, I only have so many, so many hours in a week to, to deal with these kind of things. And I just want to do things that are interesting. So some of that is just not terribly as interesting as maybe it could be. Yeah, also, I had to be, I had seen a little bit of these kind of things, and when I took measure theory. Oh, okay, so well, yeah, this for felt, sure. This felt like a particular uh, case, but I, I was most interested in the, in the later part about PCA, because I have been using it, but oh, not okay. really knowing why. Uh, getting to understand it a little bit better was useful. Yeah, I agree with you there. I also had the same experience with the PCA part because like I've I used it before and I, I just found, oh, I see, it's just eigen systems. Okay, I love eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Why didn't you just tell me that the first time I ran into this thing? Anyway, okay, so let's move on to that second section then. This is, uh, now we're gonna look at many variables or N variables. Uh, so these are usually expressed in terms of random vectors, the distribution over the random vector is given by some function for each of the components, where this is the random vector, like spelled out, right? X, all these different, it's just a way of organizing all these random variables into a vector. Uh, whoop, something went wrong here, but uh, something went wrong there, I'm gonna fix that. But it's supposed to say that the mu is defined as just the most straightforward way, so the expectation value of each of these uh, components, right? And then the covariance, um, well, so each of the variables has a variance and there are covariances between all the possible pairs, right? So these are just organized into this convenient matrix called the covariance matrix, which expresses on the diagonal, the variance of the individual variables and on the off diagonals, the covariance between the, the relevant pairs in that, in the organized as a matrix like that. Um, and this can be more compactly written as this, right? So as this outer product, X minus mu times X minus mu expectation value. So that gives you the, um, where X is a vector now, and mu is the, uh, what was defined up here. Also a vector, should be bold, but well, there's a lot of problems on this chart. Uh, and we just note that if the variables are all independent, independent clearly all the covariances are gonna be zero, we'll just have a diagonal covariance matrix like this, right? So that's pretty straightforward. And then, um, and then he talks about an important special case of the random vector is the multidimensional Gaussian, which looks like this. The distribution for in D dimensions looks like this, right? And he shows that, in fact, that these symbols that are in here actually have the, the interpretation you would hope that the expectation value of X over this multivariate distribution is mu, this vector mu, and that the covariance of this uh, matrix, of this uh, multivariate multi-dimensional Gaussian is, in fact, the sigma that's in here. This notation down here, in case you didn't recognize, is not absolute. This is actually a determinant of this matrix. And it just arises from normalizing 
this thing. So you need to do the Jacobian, blah, blah, blah. It's not terribly interesting, but that's why you end up with a determinant down there. So, and of course, if the variables are all independent, not necessarily identical, but at least independent, then the covariance matrix simplifies to be just diagonal. And as I show in the text, you just get this product of Gaussians. Very straightforward. Uh, where the sigma squared is just rewriting the variance in the common notation. Just to do a quick example, this is the same example I used before to do the example of the correlation coefficient. I'm using this as my covariance matrix. So that says that are two variables. The first variable, x, let's call it, is got a variance of three. The second variable, y, has a variance of one. And the covariance between them, this is a symmetric matrix, so it doesn't matter which one of these off diagonals you look at, is also one, right? Remember the way the covariance is defined that it is a symmetric matrix because the upper right is going to be the covariance between X and Y and the lower left is going to be the covariance between Y and X or vice versa. I'm not sure if I got that right, but it doesn't matter because it's symmetric. <laughs> and I just plot that uh, of some random draws from that distribution and we can just double check numerically using the R function covariance that in fact that I did generate a the multidimensional Gaussian that I intended to. Okay, um, now comes the some interesting parts. The first thing is this idea of transformations of Gaussians. Um, so this actually is more general than just with Gaussians. If we have a random vector uh, in n dimensions, we can perform a linear transformation of that vector, which is based ax plus b, right? So y equals ax plus b, where a is a n by n matrix and b is some offset vector, right? And the text shows, and this, these, this is probably a very important, this is actually to me a very important result that both well, obvious that the, not obvious, but it's true that the, the expectation value or the mean of uh, the new variable y is going to be a times a multi, the vector, a matrix a multiplied by the old mean plus this offset b. And more interesting and more extremely useful is this equation right here, which says the new covariance matrix is going to be transformed by A in this way right here. Because, I mean, there's a lot of cases where you're doing transformations of, of mostly Gaussians, but any random variable, and you'd love to know how the uh, how the, the group of variables, the variance between that group of variables transforms. Uh, one quick example that comes off the top of my head when you're doing linear regression, right, you have these, we'll do that later, but uh, you will have some kind of formula that tells you um, how to calculate the the uh, coefficients, and you can use this this math here to determine what the standard error, for example, on that on those coefficients are. Or I should say, you need this in order to be able to perform that calculation. Uh, okay, so now we're going to go into the eigen decomposition part, and so I'm going to I'm totally going to skip past all of his discussion of eigenvectors and eigenvalues because I'm just making the assumption that you're not going to learn it from this book and if you don't know it, you probably should go learn it somewhere else <laughs> in my view because it's such an important topic in linear algebra uh it, but it does kind of do a reasonable view, a review of what an eigenvector and eigenvalue are at least right and i'm assuming that you know what that is so basically the eigenvalues the i'm sorry the eigenvectors of a matrix are those vectors that when you multiply with that matrix they are the same, that's the eigen part, and the values are, they're not, I'm sorry, they're the same up to a scale or constant, and that scalar constant, scalar multipl uh, multiplicative constant is called the eigenvalue. There you go, there's a super nutshell version, but you're familiar with this concept, I assume, uh, Lucio, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, in the general case, uh, the, let's say the linear, linear, linear algebra case, that, that matrix you, I mean, the formula is usually U, A, U inverse, right? Yes, okay. So okay. the key thing here is that this is a symmetric matrix, right? Which is uh, in any symmetric matrix or Hermitian or any kind of normal matrix, normal having a specific definition, but- Oh, normal, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's a symmetric matrix always has two things. It has uh, real eigenvalues and it has um, uh, the transpo- has, uh, you can, uh, I should say, the eigenvectors are, are orthogonal. So in that case, the inverse is a transpose. That's all. Uh, okay. Well, actually, it's written down here, right? So there, in particular, you can make them not only orthogonal but orthonormal. You have to do, yeah, yeah you have to make them orthonormal. That's just a matter of scaling them properly, right? But well, let me just go through this. So you can the main result he has is you, for a covariance matrix, which is 
asymmetric matrix, you can diagonalize it in this way so that it's expressed as this product of a uh, matrix U, a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues of this, of the um, covariance matrix times U transpose. And that's done in, in where this U is a matrix form from the corresponding normalized eigenvectors of the, of the, of the, of the covariance matrix. So that has to be normalized in order for this U, U, transpo, U transpose U equal to identity matrix, uh, but they're automatically orthogonal. Well, it's not 100% true. I don't want to get lost in the weeds, but you can make them orthonormal. Let's put it that way. Sometimes you have degenerate eigenvalues, in which case you have to actually orth orthogonalize the two, that subspace. But now I'm really getting lost in the weeds. But. So in that case, the uh, eigenvectors are already orthogonal. We're simply normalizing the matrix. Yeah, exactly okay, right. Okay. Yeah. In any event, um, what, what I was saying though, is there, there is a case when the, when the eigenvalues are degenerate, when two eigenvalues are the same, right? Then you have to do a mathematical step to orthogonal. You, you get two arbitrary eigenvectors. They won't necessarily be orthogonal. You can make them orthogonal though because they represent the same subspace for that eigen, eigen, eigen value. That's a technical detail uh, that you, you shouldn't have to worry about, at least for the purposes of this discussion. And I think most of the numerical software packages will take care of that for you, so you don't have to worry about it. So in any event, because these are orthonormal columns, they can be serve as a basis, so we can expand our uh, random vector into uh, in terms of these eigenvectors in this way, these coefficients, which are simply determined by um, the transpose of the corresponding eigenvalue multiplied by that random vector in the original space. So the purpose of all that is if we decompose our, remember we were doing, I kind of, we kind of got lost in the weeds here. We started with a covariance matrix for a multivariate normal distribution. And now we've just changed, we're trying to change variables, so to speak, uh, to, or I, I shouldn't say, we, we can think of it that way, but we've decomposed this covariance matrix into the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And what it tells us is, uh, helps understand the multivariate Gaussian, right? So the basis vectors are the orientation. So that if you look at a plot of a multivariate Gaussian, like I did, well, well here's this, or you look at the previous scatter plot, right? Usually some kind of ellipsoid type thing in 2D, at least, right? And then the eigenvalues, or eigenvectors determine the directions of those, uh, those uh, that ellipsoid, and the eigenvalues kind of determine the width along those coordinates, right? So it just gives you a, a way of understanding the, um, the multivariate normal distribution from this point of view. And that's kind of what I got out of that. Now that I say it out loud, it's like, okay, so. <laughs> This is a little technical note here that the if you're going to make up your own arbitrary covariance matrix, you better make sure it's symmetric and positive definite. Um, otherwise, it's not going to be a very useful uh, probability distribution. So actually, that's that's one use for the kind of decomposition is do it in reverse. So you can, if you wanted to make up a particular Gaussian distribution with a particular covariance, you could you could um, start with it by figuring out which directions you want the ellipsoids to face write down those uh, vectors, those directional vectors, and then your lambdas are your uh, co your variances along those directions. And then you can then rebuild uh, by using this decomposition, the covariance matrix you want to use to simulate your particular multivariate Gaussian, for example. And you will know then you've made a proper positive definite um, covariance matrix. That's one particular use. Another use is generating random variables. So the procedure uh, for generating a single, the spelling there, single Gaussian, that's also misspelled, is typically available in any like data science package. In, in R, we have R norm, but how do you generate a multivariate Gaussian? Well, in R, you can import a library called Mass, for example. And there's other libraries that might have, but uh, I use Mass in this thing to generate the previous um, random numbers. But now we have the tools to do this directly. And the idea is to start with a, 
identical independently distributed random normal variables with mean zero and standard deviation one kind of standardized um, independent uh, Gaussians. And then we can transform it in this way with uh, the square root of the desired covariance matrix plus the desired mean and add the desired mean. And the distribution of Y, you can see in the text, shows you how to do this, uh, actually has the desired mean and covariance that you want just by doing this transformation. And the where the eigenvalues and eigenvectors come in is actually understanding how to compute this square root of the, of the um, covariance matrix. The way you do that is decompose the covariance matrix and then take the square root of the eigenvalues and re-put it back together, which is what I do here. So here's, again, my favorite covariance matrix, 3, 1, 1, 1, right? And I calculate the eigen system for this thing using the built-in R function eigen and take the eigenvalues and square root them, take the square root of them, because that's what I want, the square root of the covariance matrix, and I just put it back together. This is just that U uh, lambda, so U transpose. No. Plus um, normalization not necessary in that step. Oh, eigen eigen um, re does automatically returns normalized eigenvectors. Oh, okay, okay. Just to double check though, right? Because I always like double check. Maybe I, I it doesn't, but sure enough, sig the square root times the square root gets back to the same matrix again. So I did find the the proper square root. And there's probably some packages that will directly just do powers of matrices. I mean, there definitely is. Not probably, there definitely is. But I just wanted to show it like in this kind of raw way. Also, I thought it was kind of fun. Uh, with that in hand, now we can compute. Um, so we can just now we can do this transformation. Now I'm just going to use a here I formed a matrix of two by a thousand uh, random normal variables, right? So all they're totally uncorrelated and standard deviation zero, uh, standard deviation one means zero. And I can check that. Here's the covariance matrix. It's obviously numerically. Uh, uh, consistent with zero, uh, consistent with the one, one, zero, zero matrix, right? And now I'm just going to multiply by the square root of sigma, which is what we're doing here. Here, this is the key thing right here for each of those rows in that matrix, data matrix. I'm going to multiply by this matrix, uh, the square root of sigma times that particular row, right? And hey, it works. Yay, my new random numbers have the correct uh, correlation matrix. And then just the book notes and goes through a little example how you can use this in re reverse, which is sometimes used to, um, you know, take some kind of noise source you have that has some correlations and you want to get rid of them, you can reverse that by doing the reverse transition. Is the covariance matrix uh, a kind of unique identifier, perhaps up to some equivalence relation and for the vector type random variables for for gaussian random variables so if you for, know if you know any the... random variables in no. vector form oh, okay i don't think so i mean that's only the first mo it's only the second moment right so there's other many distributions many core many families many random vectors right will have the same uh Covariance, but not necessarily this the same you know higher order moments, whatever those would look like. I don't know tensors of some kind, I'd imagine. But but for for anybody for Gaussians, if they're normal variables or even approximately normal variables, and yeah, you have you know the mean and the covariance, that's pretty much all that you need to know. That is all you need to know for the Gaussians, but for for other or normal variables, that's all you need to know. But for more complicated cases, you need to know more things. But these, this approximation is multivariate Gaussians is common and often quite valid, <laughs> thanks to the law of large numbers. Yeah. Okay, so PCA, the idea of the PCA, the way the text says it, is the, the key idea is the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix, which we've been talking about. Um, so the, the breakdown of PCA as presented in the text is first you find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of your covariance matrix for your variables, your predictor variables, right? So we're thinking about some problem, right? We got this n predictor variables, whatever they are, and there's some response, so we're going to ignore that for now because this uh, PCA doesn't look at the response, it only looks at the predictors as a unsupervised learning method, right? So we're going to find the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues 
we sort them from the largest to the smallest, and then we truncate at some number less than n, p, um, and that truncation is determined by how well the, the uh, this approximation works, right? But um, but as far as this goes, we're just going to truncate at some p, and then we're going to project those predictor vectors back onto that smaller basis. And that's essentially what it is, right? And we using the using the predictor vectors, uh, using the uh, eigenvectors, we can pro project this onto the smaller basis of eigenvectors. So that basically allows us to compress the data into a smaller set of predictors. And they give a great example of that using this face database, right? Where the eigenvectors are these fuzzy, weird looking faces and stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, you can truncate it some number, which I think was relatively like 100 or something. And they did pretty well with that, considering that the actual number of variables, because it's like whatever, 35,000 pixels or whatever. I forget, but it's a lot, right? He does mention some limitations of this, that the PCA fails when the raw data is not orthogonal. Um, you know, it's obviously then there's no way to reduce the data. Uh, another limitation, the basis vectors are generally not interpretable. They're just like, okay, <laughs> they're like some linear combination of all the other predictors. So it doesn't really tell you, they don't really have much in, uh, ability to understand them directly. And the other thing is the PCA is unsupervised, so it doesn't depend at all on the response variable. So you might uh, pick out an important variable, but important components, but uh, doesn't necessarily tell you what the most influential components are on the response. It doesn't depend at all on the response. So just to try to make that a little more concrete, I took from um, the, wait, one, one question in the previous slide. Yes, uh, when they talk about a PCA failing when the raw data is not orthogonal, do they mean like like the the actual Tabular data frame that one has is that the rotator? They what they mean is essentially that, that if the if like two uh, if they like for example the variables are not like if you plot them a scatter plot they're not like they don't have high correlation between each other right they're just like a big ball like look at page three hundred eleven there's like a little figure that gives an example of that of a you know one case that there's yeah there's a nice strong axis axis right if, two, if the variables are not are not correlated very well then you're not gonna be able to do they're gonna they're not gonna be very orthogonal in that sense i don't know why he says orthogonal it actually oh he actually does mean that but they're not gonna be completely orthogonal i guess it's kind of a weird thing weird way to say that I kind of just brushed past that when I read it. I'm like, I don't really feel comfortable with why he says orthogonal, but like certainly if they're completely orthogonal, it'd be great. But um, I would say what he really means is to say that the raw data are not are not very are very uncorrelated, <laughs> right? Okay. I think that's what he, that's what he really seems to mean. If you look at page three eleven, that seems to be what he's saying. Yes, because I was wondering uh, because he says if the he if first when real data is not orthogonal. Uh, I was wondering, uh, but I mean, orthogonal, orthogonalizing something is quite easy, right? So uh, yeah. why would that be a problem? Yeah, I think he just means to say that data, the raw data is not correlated okay. to some degree. We don't be 100% correlated, but it was completely uncorrelated. The PC is not gonna really give you anything useful. I mean, let's, I mean, I mean just not to nail, not to, let me see, where's my... I can't find it now. Is this it? So in this case, for example, right, X and Y are not, if, if this was just a big, now in this case, right, there is some correlation between X and Y. So I could find principal axis for this thing. One would be this kind of diagonal, whoops, diagonal line through here. The other would be orthogonal to that. Pretty straightforward. Those are the principal components of this. You can just see it, right? So, but if this was a big round blob with no correlation, where would you put your principal components? There'd be no particular reason to prefer any direction over any other, right? That's what it means. Okay. All right. So, but here's an example. This example comes from the book Introduction to Statistical Learning, where they use the uh, US arrest data set, which is built into base R. Um, this is a, you, did you ever go through Introduction for Statistical Learning book? I am actually facilitating it right now. 
Oh, okay. Well, in the later chapter when they do the PCA, um, they use this example uh, in the lab for for it, right? So I picked that out because that's something where um, I know the PCA might be interesting. So I took, uh, and basically what it is, it's uh, for every uh, the 50 states in the United, United States, uh, in 1973, they looked at what are the arrests per 100,000 in, in three categories, actually, not four. In three categories. Uh, and it also gives you the, um, the percentage of the population that's considered urban population in that state as well. And, so you could try to use this to do some kind of regression, but here we're going to just look at principal component analysis. So we look at the covariance matrix of the of the data. It looks like this. You can see that the uh, some of these things have very high variances. Um, there certainly is non-zero covariances between them, so it should be interesting to try to find some principal components for this uh, data set. But um, the scale of these things is quite different. So the we're gonna, first thing we need to do is uh, scale, center and scale the data. So the R function scale will take the data and normalize it so that it has not normalized in the other sense. I mean, scale is so it has mean zero and standard deviation one, right? So that we're only looking at the only the important parts of this. Not If you don't do this, it turns out that assault dominates everything just because it's a bigger values, right? So it's, we wanna get them all on the same scale. And then I calculate the covariance matrix for the scaled case, which I didn't print out, but it's obviously going to be smaller. Uh, and then I'm going to take that scaled case, uh, that covariance matrix that I found, and find the eigen system. And here's the eigenvalues, right? And so the first plus component should be the eigen um, vector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue. Eigen system is nice. Eigen the function eigen in R is nice because it does return things in the most useful way and that it gives you the values in descending order and the eigenvectors are all orthonormal, if they can be, that is, right? So the largest eigenvalue corresponds to this eigenvector right here. So that's the first, the loading, what they call the loading factors for the first principal uh, component. And it's not, there's not much you can say about it. It's like, okay, well, it's got a little bit of a US murder. It's got a little bit of assault. A little bit influenced by urban population and by rape, almost all equal except for the urban population seems to be a little less on that one for whatever reason. That first principal component, um, and just for fun, we'll just verify that this really is the eigenvector. So I take the covariance matrix, multiply it by this eigenvector, and divide it by its corresponding eigenvalue, and yeah, I get the same thing back again. So okay, good. We understand. I actually did that just to make sure I took the right thing here. I was I supposed to take the columns, or the, I was pretty sure I took the right thing there, but. Um, just wanted to make sure there's a column, not the row. And just for comparison uh, here, I use the R function, principal components, and using the scale equals true, so it does the same kind of normalization that I did. Uh, same type of standardization. That's the word I'm trying to think of, standardization. The same type of standardization that I did. And ask it what it, in principal component function calls the, uh, the loading factors, the rotations. And here they are, principal component one, two, three, and four. And hey, look, they're exactly the same as the eigenvectors. So that's that's reassuring that the, <laughs> that the, that their the claim was actually true. That the eigen system, what was the claim? I'm sorry. PCA is eigen decomposition of the vectors. Okay, so there you go. PCA is in fact the eigen decomposition of the covariance vector because these this is the eigenvectors of the of uh, the um, covariance matrix, and this is the PCA from the built-in R function. And just for fun, we could I mean, we could go back, go through and calculate the data coefficients manually and uh, do all that stuff, but just in the interest of time, I'm just gonna use this biplot built-in function. And this is from chapter um, 12 in Introduction to Statistical Learning. And this kind of shows you how all this, this is the, the, principal, the first two principal components. So principal component one, principal component two, and this is where all the states fall on that um, uh, on that on those principal components, right? The red um, arrows here are meant to show the amount of each of the underlying predictors that are in that principal component. So the so way you read that is, for example, if I look at PC two is zero along this line then the projection of these red arrows onto the horizontal line tells me how much of that uh, component is in underlying, sorry, underlying um, 
predictor is in that component, which, you know, you, we have the numbers up here. You can see it makes sense that urban population is less for PC1. And you can see that it's kind of tilted more down, right? So the projection of this on the x-axis is small, smaller than it is, for example, on the y-axis, which is PC2. And PC2, as you can see, is dominated a lot by urban population, right? So that makes sense. But other than that, I'm not sure like what you get out of this. I don't know. I mean, maybe I got to go back and reread that chapter in, uh, in Introduction to Statistical Learning. But that is the, uh, the the only the cool thing for me is just the verifying fact that this PCA is um, the eigensystem of the covariance. Uh, anyway, that's basically all I have. I see we're actually at the end of the hour, so. Uh, any, any other comments or concerns about this chapter? I hope that uh, helped a little bit on the reading. Yes, yeah, it was a, a little bit more rough. Uh, as you said, it was more <laughs> dense, but uh, at least I, I like this part of the PCA because I had kind of skimmed uh, a little informal proof of why PCA worked. But I mean, they, they had many drawings and such, and I didn't yeah. really get it. But via yeah, this approach, I mean, I, I'm used to linear algebra, so it's Me too. More, quite more clear now. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, I guess we're out of time. So I will, what my plan is, we are taking a break next week. Uh, my plan is to sometime in the next week to try to do a couple of the problems in the back uh, in this book, in this chapter, and um, uh, post them as we discussed. And let's see who are you signed up for? Oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong book club. And yeah, I am signed up for the next chapter. Okay. I also already signed up for for the last one. Okay, good deal. Uh, so this next uh, chapter of sample statistics is going to get into finally some data science type stuff. So I'm looking forward to that um, and putting some rigor on the bones of some stuff we already know. It'll be fun. Anyway, I appreciate your patience with me today. I, I was throwing this together yesterday and I didn't really have a chance to really check through all this to make sure it flowed properly or anything. And, uh, but I can still kick, it's just you and me and we're just kind of doing this in a more informal level. So uh, I hope that was helpful. Yes, it was, thank you. And I'll see you in two weeks, two weeks. Okay, bye. All right, thanks, Lucio. Thanks. Ah, oh, wait, wait. Uh, yes, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm uh, here. You're also interested in the Julian, the Julian book club, right? Yeah, I am. Uh, like I posted on there, I said, it's just the right, I mean, to me, it's just, I'm in this book club, I'm in the Advanced Star Book Club, and I'm also in a um, Regression of Other Stories book club. So I need to wait for at least one of those to, to fizzle out before I get started on another one. I won't have time to add another one to my uh, list yeah, right now. I, I already read most of the, of the, later version of the book that we would see here okay. for Julia. But I, I also need to wait to for book clubs to end. I think okay. around March I'll be in five makes... of them. So <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. Perhaps in June I could do it uh, for the Julia book club. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> I think June's okay. a, good, a good place to look <laughs> in my schedule. Okay, well, see you in two weeks. All right, see ya. Bye. Bye.